All right. Shalom. Shalom. Welcome back to the channel. You guys, I am Jonathan, the code searcher. And some of you are not going to, excuse me, some of you are not going to um, appreciate what I'm about to present to you. But I think like yesterday's broadcast, I think this is very critical. And so we're going to approach this uh, situation with logic and reason. So pay attention, right? Do you know Yeshua? Do you know who he is? Or do you call him Jesus? Folks, do you know we have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy? And you know if he sees in the plain text of the scripture where it says there's power in the name to call upon a name, to exalt the name. If you were to fly in the wall in the meeting of Satan and his minions, and you were listening in, and they're talking about the power of that name and what to do about it. Folks, what, what do you think the enemy would do if he knew there was power in a name? Maybe change it? Interesting thought. I want to introduce you to um, another Jewish um, believer. A little different than a little bit different than Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah, I believe, is, is a closet believer. Uh, I have another friend who's a rabbi, and he believes in Yeshua, and he does the same thing. He even uh, has a synagogue that he is the head rabbi at, and no one there knows that he believes in Yeshua, yet he does. So I believe ne ne Nehemiah is in the same thing, and, and the reason for that is if they come out public, um, it's it's basically tar and feather, right? They, they, you're an outcast in your community. So um, I wouldn't say it's dishonest. Um, you know, it might be strategic, but it is what it is. This brother, on the other hand, actually does publicly proclaim that Yeshua is the Messiah. And you see the title of his video here. And by the way, this is Lapid Judaism. Lapid means the torch. And uh, this would be a Messianic rabbi here. He does keep to some of the traditions of the Jews, just like Christians do with, you know, keeping traditions of the Catholic Church. And I mean, Protestants do that. Um, so there's no difference. Uh, the point is, he has a perspective that is unique to Judaism. He understands the man. And just like yesterday with Nehemiah and what I was trying to convey to you, there is a difference between the Roman Jesus or the Greek Jesus and the actual man, Yeshua. Please listen in. Comment down below. We're gonna. It's only, you know, less than an hour for this video, so I think it will uh, uh, edify you, and I think it will educate you. So let's listen in together. Are they really the same person? Is it really all the same? Does it really matter? Does it make a difference? Uh, what's really the answer there? Well, good evening. Welcome to this special lesson on what I think is a very important topic can be a confusing topic it can be a challenging topic to tackle uh, because there's a risk which i'm going to attempt to avoid with with god's help bezrat hashem that it can become a tr seemingly trivial it could it can become uh some people might perceive it anyway to be a discussion of semantics you say Yeshua, I say Jesus. Really, we're talking about the same thing. But I hope to illustrate and demonstrate through thought-provoking concepts, making a difficult top topic easy to understand, that really it's not the same. And yes, it does in fact matter. And I also hope to express some ideas that might give the listener pause to ask themselves the question, why? Why don't we say Yeshua? Why don't we believe in Yeshua? Uh, things of that nature. So good evening. Glad you're here. Remember to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already and uh, strike that bell so you can be kept up to date on surprise teachings we do like this. And uh, like the video and leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think about what's being shared here. This teaching comes to all of us by popular demand. I asked if this would be something that people would like to know about. And uh, overwhelmingly, the feedback I received was yes, 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 yes. And by the way, yes. So here we are. So let's discuss for a minute. Let's begin with the etymology. And then I want to get into the, to, to the philosophy of this. 
people ask frequently, they ask us, they ask me, so do you believe in Jesus? Um, and very often I'll say, well, we believe in Yeshua. We don't really believe in Jesus. And I know that that answer to a lot of people who love the Messiah and really are devoted to Hashem, devoted to God, I know that for a lot of people that is confusing. It's a, it's a head scratcher. They don't understand it. Um, and I, and I, and I get it. It's, it's challenging to, uh, to explain how we can believe in Yeshua, the Yeshua of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if we were using those English names and yet not believe in Jesus to a lot of people. That's like, what? I don't get it. And I understand that you don't get it. And I get that you don't get it, which is why we're having this discussion tonight. Um, <clears throat> It, I cringe very often when I see on Messianic websites, usually Messianic, because that's usually where you find something like this, is they'll say, this congregation believes in Yeshua, and then they'll put in parentheses, Jesus. Or they'll say, Yeshua slash Jesus. Now, there's lots of different problems with that. And as I said, we're going to be talking about the etymology here in just a quick minute. But let me just say philosophically that... I'm a big believer in not perpetuating bad education. You know, you hear people say, and by the way, I don't, I don't think this is a truthful uh, thing for that people say. But anyway, they'll say, well, you know, you ask, well, look, why does your denomination, church, whatever, continue to do Easter and not Passover? Well, it's because the world around us is used to Easter bunnies and they're not used to Passover. My response to that is, well, yeah, because they're not being taught. Because you're not teaching it, they don't know. How many Christians do you know when you start teaching them about Passover, they're like, wait, what? What is that? Wait, what? There's a, 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 a Seder? And then when you start to show them the Seder and explain to them how every single piece of it speaks about the Messiah, it's, it's so clear it, a fifth grader could get it. They're blown away. Conversely, just to use Easter as an example, there is literally nothing about Easter. The egg, the rabbit, uh, whatever, nothing about it. Let me just uh, tag something on right here because I, I see this with, um, with Christianity and talking about um, taking traditions of men. And, and in another teaching, I've talked to you about how um, – in the Catholic Church, there was a separation or a schism or a breakaway, and it was called the protest, right? And this happened under Martin Luther some 500 years ago, but but there's been splits off. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church actually split and made other Catholic Church like the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. And, you know, the, there, there were a handful of them, right? The, the Church of England is, is Catholic-like, right? But then you have the Protestants, that break off and, and and become the Protestant churches. Well, they took with them some of these traditions, like they don't keep Passover. What do they do? They keep the tradition of the Catholic Church. They do what's called the Eucharist. And by the way, listen, folks, the Last Supper, Yeshua was not establishing the Eucharist. What Yeshua was doing is what he just said. There were there all these parts of, of the Passover Seder that he was teaching about himself, that he was fulfilling himself. Showing them that this is my body and this is my blood, and this is why you have been doing this this seder for fifteen hundred years up until that point, right? Yeshua was teaching them this. Was he teaching them what the Catholic Church does today with a little wafer and a little bit of? No, he was not, and certainly not what the Christians continue to do with the. And by the way, it was the Catholic Church that integrated the pagan festival of Easter or Ishtar worship. It's a, it's a fraternity, fraternity, fraternity. You know what I mean? <laughs> My tongue is getting tied today. Fraternal, fraternity, fraternity. You know what I mean? It's to be able to have babies, right? And so what they would do is they would boil eggs in the, in the, in the blood of, of sacrificed babies and they would turn them pink. That's how we get the colored eggs. That's a historical fact, folks. The Catholic Church integrated this and did away with the Seder. 
and kept their own little ritual, right? Which was is basically sun worship. Let's continue. Whatsoever, no custom associated with it has anything remotely to do. Does it even illustrate in, in any way, shape or form anything about the Messiah in any way? And as we know, that particular holiday is thoroughly pagan, but that's beside the point. So my point, my, my issue here is, is when we propagate things that aren't true, such as Jesus is parentheses, G, excuse me, Yeshua is in parentheses Jesus, we just continue to propagate bad education and we're not educating people on the facts that are just facts. They're not, the, what I'm going to share with you tonight and I'm just checking my mind right quick, make sure I'm not making a false statement, just make sure, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm pretty much clear. Um, it's the truth. I'm not expressing to you my opinion. If I if I do express my opinion this evening, I will let you know. But I'm telling you facts tonight. And it, this is an opportunity for people to become educated. Again, if we don't ever teach anybody about Passover and we just continue to propagate Easter, again, to use that as an example, then, yeah, the people are going to keep doing it because they don't know any different. We're supposed to be leading people, not allowing them to lead us. So think about it. When a, a leader says, well, I only do this because they're used to it. Well, guess what? You're not leading. That's called following. So philosophically, the reason why a topic like this matters to me is because I like to lead people and to educate people and to help people get the information they need to take a step back and go, you know, that makes perfect sense. And by the way, everything I'm going to tell you tonight, you can look up for yourself. And, and by the way, what I do know about this topic, I did not learn on YouTube. Not that YouTube is a bad place, but you know, there's you got to be careful. What I'm teaching you tonight, you can go to reputable vetted sources and find this out. So again, <clears throat> there, the, the letter in the letters of Paul, we find a statement that I think that most people who believe in the Messiah would agree to. Okay. And that is that there's one name under heaven given among, uh, among men whereby we must be saved. How many of you believe that? How many of you have believed that? There is a name. Now, again, the risk here is to become semantical. And that's not really what I'm, I'm getting at. But let's us first and foremost, let's establish that name names matter. Because in, a, in this discussion, what a lot of people come to the conclusion of, what they've been told is it doesn't matter. You can call the name, you can call upon the name of the Messiah, whatever you call him in whatever language. But, but in fact, ladies and gentlemen, that's not really true. Absolutely not true. And you can see this in Matthew 7 when there's this whole demographic of Christians who are saying, Lord, Lord, or Jesus, Jesus, right? And his name is not Lord either. We'll cover that another time. And he says, depart from me. I don't know who you are, right? And then we see that that the enemy through man has erased the name of the father, yod heh from the book 6,000 times. So the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy and he's doing that by stealing a name from you and giving you, it's called a bait and switch, giving you a, a false name that you will call on. Listen to me now. This is very serious. We can't just say, oh, he knows my heart. He knows. No, the Bible says your heart is wicked. Who can, above all things, right? It's, it's, it's wicked and it's deceitful and it will lie to you. Your own heart will lie to you. So let's be careful of, of listening to your heart or whatever, right? If you went to SYBC church and you said, they said, you know, we're going to baptize you tonight. Do you believe in Jesus? And you said, uh, well, actually, I confess his name, Pedro. I confess his name, Ari. I confess his name, um, I don't know. Pick a name, Frank, uh, Sean Swan, right? I, I, I'm, I'm relatively sure that they probably wouldn't baptize you, and I don't think the pastor would go, "Oh, that's cool." Well, who's Pedro to you? Pedro to me is the crucified Messiah. Okay, awesome. Welcome to our church. Raise your hand out there if you think a pastor would do that. 
I'm going to suggest to you that that's probably not the case. They would probably talk to said person and convince them that they need to call upon the name of Jesus because that's the name whereby we must be saved. How many of you would agree with that? Are there pastors that would be like, okay, whatever, Pedro, Ari, Sheshwan, whatever you want to call him, that's cool. I'm sure there are because there's fruitcakes in every bowl. But I'm going to tell you that probably that's not the case. So what does that tell us? It tells us that names do in fact matter. And if we do believe that there is a name, not a name, but a the name, there's one name, I should say, under heaven, then we have to believe that, right? Okay. <clears throat> so let's get down to in the Gospels, the angel appears to Miriam, and the angel says to her, you shall call his name blank. Fill in the blank. What do English translations say nowadays in our, in our modern times? They say Jesus, right? Is that what the angel said? No. Did the angel use the Greek Iesus? No. What did the angel say? Well, the angel would have been speaking to her in Hebrew because that's the language of heaven. You say, well, it could have been Aramaic. Well, let me ask you a question. Can you read Aramaic? I can. I can. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. It's somewhere else. But in every Chumash, there is Ankylos Aramaic translation of the Torah. Did you know that? And there's a little paragraph next to the Hebrew that's the Aramaic. And the Aramaic letters are exactly the same as Hebrew letters. There's very little difference between the two languages in terms of being able to read it. Point being that Yeshua is Yeshua is Yeshua. The angel would have said to her, you shall call his name Yeshua. Okay? People think, the reason I brought that up is because some people think, I think, I think that some people think, this is my opinion, <laughs> that they think that Aramaic is some type of like other completely different language. Like you have Hebrew, and then you have like, like Hebrew and then Japanese, like Hebrew and then like Chinese, but they're pretty much the same. Okay. Now, if you're going to get to the nitty gritty, I'm so some linguists out there would discuss the differences and that's fine. But I think they would agree with me that essentially they're relatively the same. So <clears throat> the angel would have said to her, call his name Yeshua. Even if you look up in the concordance and you look up the Greek Iesus, it is going to tell you right there. It's going to say that the etymology root of this word is the Hebrew Yehoshua. So people have said to me many times, which is also a falsehood. They have said, well, yeah, you say Yeshua. But Yeshua in English is just Jesus. That's not true either. Uh, the reality is, is that Yehoshua, which is which is where Yeshua come from, comes from. The Yeshua is a shortened uh, version of Yehoshua. And by the way, it is one hundred percent without any doubt. It's not up for debate. It's not debatable. Okay, the sky is red, the moon is round, and the Messiah's name is Yeh. Shua from Yehoshua. There is not a, a linguist on the planet who's vetted and educated and actually is credentialed who would ever say that the name of the Messiah is anything other than Yeshua or Yehoshua. I want to make that crystal clear. Okay. So if in fact you come across other pronunciations such as Yahshua or Yahushua or whatever, just understand that that is not correct. It's again, it's not up for debate, okay? Now, if you translate Yehoshua or Yeshua into English, the the English word would be Joshua. That is correct. Therefore, just as a simple example, if you're running around town and you run into a young man and his name is Joshua, if you were going to call his name in Hebrew, you would call him Yehoshua or Yeshua. For this very reason, when you are speaking Hebrew conversationally and you're talking about the book of Joshua, 
you are, it's very frequently just in casual Hebrew conversation referred to as the book of Yeshua. Joshua is called Yeshua. In fact, I was watching a video one time, it was in Hebrew, and the rabbi was talking about, he was going over the Holy Land, he was talking about the conquest of Joshua. And every time he said Joshua's name, he said Yeshua. So in Hebrew, he's basically saying, Yeshua conquered here, Yeshua invaded here, Yeshua led the army here, etc. Okay. What about the name Jesus? Remember, before he gets into that, I just want to point out, because he was talking about Jesus and Joshua, that if you look at the story of Joshua and Caleb in the Old Testament, and that word there in the Greek, Jesus, is this very same one they use in the New Testament to, to um, for Jesus. Yet in the Old Testament, it's translated from the Greek to the English, uh, right, and from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English as Joshua. But yet we see this anomaly in the New Testament where the very same word, folks, it's not changed at all. There's no difference at all. And suddenly we see this name Jesus appear. And, and by the way, why are we translating his name in the first place? You know, if we were talking about the Chinese president or, or uh, whatever, you know, we don't translate his name. Even, even if we are English speakers, even if we are Hebrew speakers, in your native tongue, you're going to use the original name. Even though you speak English, there is no English translation for, you know, the Chinese president. <laughs> his name is his name, right? So why do we translate Yeshua's name into English? And it's a suddenly a different word. You need to think about that because the enemy was willing to come steal, kill, and destroy. And he will lie to you. He'll put on a suit and get up in the pulpit and preach to you the name Jesus. He will do that. Why? Why would he do that? Because there's power in the name. There's salvation in the name, literally. We're talking here about the name of the Messiah. We're talking about here about the name that you want to confess in order to be born again, to be saved. So therefore, I think that we can all agree that that name matters. It does matter, doesn't it? Of course it does. Naturally it does. Um, so the name Jesus, and I'm going to post some of these notes, by the way, in the description of this video, so that you know you can have access to this information in the, in the description of this video. But the, the short version is this. The letter J uh, is, a, is a relative modern uh, part of our alphabet. I was just looking right before this video started. I was just referencing the, uh, I have an original print. I happen to have an original print of the 1854 Webster's Dictionary. And when you open up to the section where it begins the J's, there's a paragraph. And in there, Webster mentions that, J is a modern addition to the language. And before that, it was written with an I. Um, and at some point around the the dates here, some some somewhere around the Middle English period, from the, about the late 1100s to about the mid 1200s, the I started to develop a a um, uh, kind of a, a, a G type of sound, kind of a, a diphthong, as they say. And so not getting too heavy and deep into the etymology in this video, because we don't, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of um, information that you can read for yourself. But what happened was, is that eventually this letter J was literally invented in order to allow for this diphthong that had developed in the English language that was partly derived from the fact that English is really a language that developed out of, out of an amalgamation of other languages such as Latin, German, and French. And therefore, the name Jesus, and this is the bottom line, the name Jesus was printed, was developed, was used, for the first time ever in the history of mankind in 1632, which would mean that as of right now, 
the name Jesus is literally 390 years old. Let me say that again. The name Jesus is 390 years old. That's all. Let's, let's, let's think about something for a moment. What do you think his mother called him? Jesus? What do you think they call him in heaven? Jesus? They have no idea who Jesus is. Nobody that lived in the time of Yeshua knows that name or would recognize that name. It's only been around for 390 years, folks, less than 500 years. And we have this we have this problem with Matthew 7 where there's this whole demographic of people who who are using a name to heal the sick and cast out demons and to, you know, they prophesied in that name, right? And yet Yeshua says, depart from me, I don't know who you are. Now, we see a, par a parable of the 10 versions that's dealing with the same thing. They don't have any oil. They come back with the oil. And, and he says, I don't know who you are. But when we look at the entomology of the word oil and in, in the name, uh, the word name, Shem and Shemin, it's virtually the same word. Just one letter difference. You take that letter off, you got the same word. So the word oil literally has the root word name in it. I'll let you think about that for a moment. Oh. Prior to 1632, it did not exist. Now, something else that's kind of comical about this situation is that I know that, that there are a great many people out there who believe that the King James Version of the Bible, the 1611 King James Version, to them is the only uh you know, proper, right, authentic, authoritative, unadulterated um, English version of the Bible. To them, the King, it's their King James only, right? And that that the translation hasn't been quote messed with. Now, what's somewhat funny about that, a little tongue in cheek, is that the 1611 King James version did not have Jesus in it at all. It actually had the, at that, they, it had the English spelling of the Messiah's name at that time, which was a transliteration of a translation of the Greek, which was spelled, and I'm just looking at my notes, if I can find it right quick in my eye. Uh, it's basically, it's, it's, it's essentially Iesus, but they drop one of the letters from the Greek. I think they dropped the U. It doesn't really matter. I don't really see it in front of me. Uh, oh, here it is. In English, it's Iesu, I-E-S-U. So if you actually had the original 1611 King James Version Bible, uh, the original printing, you would not see Jesus in any of it. It would only be Iesu, uh, Iesu, right? You could pronounce it that way in the with the diphthong. The, the point being is that the King, which this was just a little bit comical for those who are, you know, King James only fans. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but as it turns out, your precious unadulterated um, version has been adulterated. Uh, it was changed and this was added, uh, what, 20, 21 years later, 21 years later, they added this brand new name. So etym etymologically speaking, um, the name of the Messiah is not Jesus. Now, to some people, that may be kind of like a shoulder shrug, but should it be? Should it be a shoulder shrug? Really, we're just going to shoulder shrug that off like it doesn't matter? Doesn't it? Uh, and if we know this, and uh, uh, again, you know, people say, well, but what about, you know, Nanny, N Nana believed in Jesus and she's passed away now. Does she go to heaven? Hey, you know what? I don't ever make a judgment call on anybody's salvation. That's not really what this is about. This is about what we know. And I know some of you are, I know some of you are thinking the very same thing. Well, Jonathan, I was saved under the name Jesus. And my, my you know, what about my grandparents, right? Well, here's the thing. In Leviticus, there is a provision um, that we are not held accountable for ignorance. 
And a, and a good example of that is Yeshua was was pronouncing this on the cross while he was being nailed to the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Okay. He was citing something that was in Leviticus, right? We're not held accountable for something we, we don't know. And Yah will meet us there, by the way. He will meet us in a place like that, right? The difference is when you come to the truth and you are finally brought to the truth and now you've been told and you now you know, and here, here's what's, what's kind of interesting. The fact that you're watching this video, ignorance no longer is a factor. Now you know, and, and it's a matter of choice. What do you do with it, right? So here's where it, you know, things change for you. Grandma's going to be fine. She's, she's, you know, she's resting in the arms of Yeshua, even though she called him Jesus. It's okay. But now the truth is out. Now we have to do something with that, right? We can't hide it under a bushel. We can't shrug, shrug our shoulders and just move on. We have to take it serious, right? By the way, when I first started teaching the name, I had this guy who had been watching me for years, an older fellow who was in a wheelchair and had uh, severe diabetes. His legs were just bad with open sores that never healed and things like that. And they were, they were going to have to cut off his legs and things like that. And he got really upset with me because I was teaching a name. He said, Jonathan, you've become a sacred namer and I don't know if I can watch you anymore and da, 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 da. And man, I've been calling on Jesus all my life and, you know, and you know what I said to him, just the simple words, because I knew his story. I'd been talking with him on the phone. I'd conversed with him in email. I knew he would, he was sick, always sick, by the way. But when he told me that he has always called on the name Jesus, I simply messaged him back. So tell me how that's working out for you. And then silence. I didn't hear from him for at least a week. And he came back and he apologized to me. And said, you know what? You were right. I've been calling on Jesus all my life, even in my sick bed, when they're going to cut my legs off. And I wasn't getting healed. I want you to think about that, folks. Oh, now there's reasons why we didn't know this before, but now we know it now. So we're going to deal with what we know now and not worry about the past. Let, let the past be the past. But the point is, what do we know now and what do we do about it moving forward? And the reality is, is the name of the Messiah is Yeshua. I mean, come on. You know, even everybody, you say, well, what about the Greek? Well, the, everybody realizes the Greek is just a translation of the original, do we not? So therefore, when, when the Messiah was, let me, let me put it like this. Let me put it like this. If you were able to get in a time capsule and go back in time to the days of the Messiah or the days shortly thereafter the resurrection, and you wanted to believe in him, you would be calling him by the name Yeshua. Of course. Now let me ask you another question. This is just really for you, food for thought. Um, think about all the other prophets, messiahs, religious figures, saviors, if you will, from all the other religions, whether it be Buddha, Muhammad, Hare Krishna, um, uh, pick your deity's name, savior's name, whatever. You know what I find fascinating is that when you go into other kind, other cultures, Muhammad's name in those cultures is Muhammad. Buddha's name in those cultures is Buddha. Same thing for Hare Krishna, same thing for all the other deities. They don't translate their names. The only name of a messianic figure, if you will, that is translated among human beings is the one name that's supposed to be the only name, which in fact it isn't. I mean, just speaking of it logically, if I tell you there's one name whereby you must be saved, and that one name is Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, I just gave you four names right? Isn't that the truth? Is Yeshua too hard to say? It's not. I've never met anybody who couldn't say Yeshua in any language. And I've known people from other languages, and they can all say it, right? So it's not challenging. It's not difficult. 
Now let's that's so that's the etymology. I don't think I left anything out of that. I think I pretty much covered the basis on um, that reality. And if if we say to ourselves, by the way, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, then then we can't simultaneously believe that there's one name under heaven whereby you must be saved. That if it doesn't matter, then that statement is fundamentally false. But let's talk about it on a deeper level. People say, okay, okay, but I believe in Jesus and you believe in Yeshua. Don't we believe in the same Messiah? And the answer to that is no, not really. Now, I understand that it can be confusing, and I appreciate that, but let me, let me try to explain why we make that distinction. First of all, and this is my opinion I'm going to give you here. This is just my theory. This is my theory. If the name of the Messiah is, in fact, Yeshua, why did we translate it to begin with? Now, I will say this. Way back 2,000 years ago, it was probably considered by the Talmudim, by the disciples, okay to translate the Gospels into Greek in order to distribute them amongst the, you know, people who couldn't speak Hebrew. Did you hear what he just said? Uh, because. I just told you that in the last video. They wrote. Okay, so they they had the Aramaic that they that they spoke. And they more than likely wrote down their their, you know, thoughts and their memories and, and everything of Yeshua. Because that's basically what Matthew, Mark, and Luke did, is wrote down their version of what they remembered about Yeshua and preserved it. Then that was translated to Greek, folks. This is why we have Hebraisms in the in the Greek. And then when you translate it to the English, things are lost in that. Right? Remember what Nehemiah said after reading. Um, the New Testament, he could tell that there are Hebraisms that did not translate over good in the Greek, right? So this notion that the Greek is superior and that, and that the, the New Testament was written in Greek is a falsehood, folks, that's taught by pastors, and it's false. When Yeshua got up into the podium in the synagogue and pulled out the scroll for Isaiah, he did not read it in Greek, folks. He, he read it in the Aramaic, okay? So it matters. It does matter. He's bringing up a really good point. All right. And uh, I, I just I just said that in the last video. This is why those tribes were up in the Greek Isles by that time. They had become Hellenized. Right. And they spoke Greek. And so if you're going to communicate with them, you have to write in the language that, that they read. And that's why we have Greek um, scrolls of the New Testament. The, back then, Greek was like pretty much like English is today. It was considered the lingua franca of the world. Now, English has pretty much taken that place. They probably thought it was okay to do that because the gospels are in fact scripture. You're asking yourself maybe, well, why? In other words, here's the point I'm getting to in case I, I, you not follow me. The question becomes, why is it okay to say a Greek version of his name and not okay to say a, a Spanish or French or Japanese version, for instance, right? The answer is, is because the only other language that was authorized that a Torah scroll could be written in other than Hebrew was Greek. And this came down by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin agreed that you, we could translate the, the Bible into Greek, but no other language. Meaning, I say Bible, I'm talking about a Torah scroll, Okay. So that's a possibility. But the, the main question is, why, if we know his name is Yeshua, why not use Yeshua? And, I, and sometimes you'll run into people and you'll tell them these things like I just told you, and they'll continue to say Jesus. And I'm not talking about out of habit, because it does habitually take, it takes someone a while to get out of the habit of saying Jesus, especially if they've been saying it, you know, for most of their life. But, you know, that's okay. It's okay. It, it takes time and that's fine. People, you know, who are new to our, our movement will say to me, you know, Jesus, and they'll go, oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi. I was like, it's okay. You've been saying this name. It's okay. And you're getting into that now. You're making, 
you're making a new habit. That's fine. But I'm, I'm talking more about people who seemingly know the truth, but they refuse to use the name Yeshua. The question becomes why. I believe this is my theory because it's a, it's a deep-seated anti-Semitism. I'm not saying that they're like vehement anti-Semites or racist. I'm just saying that deep within them, there is this anti-Semitic flow that they're not even aware of, that they don't want the Messiah to be Jewish. They don't want to bring Yeshua into his actual place because that, you understand. See, when you start calling the, the Messiah by the name Yeshua, it, that it's subtle, but it begins a rather catastrophic change in the outlook on the Gospels. Now you have to approach the Gospels from a Hebrew mindset as opposed to a Greek or Roman or English mindset. I'm doing my best to explain this, and I pray that it's so far I'm not, um, uh, you know, messing it up so far. <laughs> I think he's doing a, a, a good job. He's actually big help to me because me saying it over and over again without a witness, even though I show scriptures, people people are the same way. Uh -huh. He knows my heart, right? And it's so it's so disappointing. I like to see people get on fire for for him and for his truth. And when I see that, it blesses me to see that. And so that's my my hope and my goal for you is to come to the truth. And to understand some of these things, because it does matter, folks. And, and after he's finished, we're going to go to the scripture and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the parable of the 10 versions as I'm sitting here thinking about it and, and the importance of that parable and what it's teaching us. Because I see a lot of opinions on, you know, what that parable means. But the Bible, listen, the Bible interprets itself. And I'm going to show you how that is. But let's go back to the Jesus versus Yeshua thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, John. So in in people's hearts, because who come out of the church world, there is very often a deep-seated anti-Semitism that they're not even aware of. Question becomes, why is that the case? How could that be? Well, it's it's easy. The church fathers were vehement anti-Semites, every single one of them. And so they fought with their whole heart to try to pull the faith away from its Jewish context. Let me just clarify what he's talking about here when he says early church fathers. He's talking about, no, not, not in the time of, he's talking about after 300, when, when Rome hijacked what was called the way. It was not called Christianity. I know what you, you see over in the New Testament, uh, coming from the word Christos, they were called Christians. No, they were called Nazarene, folks. And Yeshua was from Nazareth. Nazarene is a form of that. Nazarene also means a guardian, right? So even in the semantics of that, uh, we, we find deception, okay? Um, we were called Nazarites or Nazarenes guardians of of the word not christians and so um uh it's it's important to understand some of this this history um who these church fathers were um you know some of them were heretics uh they were they were you know if you look at what happened with the crusades and what they were doing you know they were killing jews right there was this mandate christians under the banner of christianity were killing the jews right so he's right the early church fathers not the way leaders uh <laughs> hated the the judaism part um you know the constantine creed is very clear where they were purging all the jewishness out of uh the way okay context that's historical fact what i told you right now is not an opinion it's historical fact they provided a lot of great literature for people like adolf hitler to share his thoughts so bringing yeshua in there really kind of by the way adolf hitler considered himself a christian and was doing the world a favor by killing the jews you see what i'm what i mean by this is i don't call myself a christian because of these things 
I started there, but I crossed over. The word Ibrit, Hebrew means to cross over, to come out of her, my people. You see, you see what I'm saying? Okay. So Hitler, who was a Lutheran Christian, was killing Jews. So that was all, all the way up until modern times where this is happening. Kind of troubling because it pulls them out of a Greco-Roman mind and puts them into a Hebrew mind. And that's a, that's a challenge for a lot of people. So we don't believe in Jesus, but you say, well, well, why not? Don't you believe in the gospels? Yes, but okay, but let's talk about it like this. When people talk about what Jesus, what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, as opposed to Yeshua HaMashiach, it's really two different gospels. Fundamentally two different gospels. And that's really the point. Another witness, I told you the same thing. It's two different things. When you're examined both, it's two different things. This is this dualism. It's almost like one is fighting in front of the other. Almost like the Catholic Church invented, oh, reinvented. Would No, they wouldn't do that. Would they, would they do that? Satan will work through man. I told you, they'll put on a, they'll put on a robe. They'll put on a kippah. They'll put on a three-piece suit and get in the pulpit and teach you deception. The Jesus, the Jesus Christ of Rome tells people that you don't have to obey the law of God at all. In fact, the Jesus Christ of Rome would say, not only are you to disregard, as an example, the kosher laws, but as a matter of fact, at all of our festivals, we're going to have ham, roasted pig, as the main course. The Yeshua of the actual Gospels would say, not only are you supposed to keep kosher, that lamb should be the main course of your festivals, as an example. The Jesus Christ of Rome says you should abandon all of the festivals of the Jews, also known as the festivals of the Bible, and you should adopt all the festivals of Greco-Roman pagan societies to include the Nordics, to include the Celts and so forth. Yeshua the gospel says, no, you're going to actually celebrate all the festivals. You're going to keep that. The Jesus Christ of Rome is going to say your, you know, special day of rest, your Sabbath is going to be Sunday, which is the day dedicated to Sol Invictus, which was the patron deity of Constantine, which is why that was made the day. And so Sunday is going to be your day uh, in contrast to what the Bible clearly teaches. And Jesus HaMashiach, or excuse me, Yeshua HaMashiach, it says, no, we're going to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is going to continue to be the honored seventh day. In fact, it's so honored that Miriam is going to refuse to bury me refuse to take care of my body after I've been crucified specifically because she wants to honor the Shabbat. That's how important the Shabbat is to Yeshua HaMashiach. Um, the Jesus Christ of Rome is going to suggest that people should use the cross as their emblem. Uh, which was an emblem that has no historical validity whatsoever. Uh, we have no idea what the crucifixion stake looked like. Uh, the cross actually comes to us as a symbol from Constantine, not from any biblical resource whatsoever. And uh, that's going to be our emblem. Yeshua HaMashiach's like, uh, no. You know, there's not a stated emblem of what belongs to the believers of Messiah Yeshua because there doesn't need to be because we're Jews. So the emblem, the emblem uh, of, of Judaism is consistent with belief in Yeshua Mashiach. And, you know, then we get into the translation that Jesus Christ of Rome is going to say, well, the letters of Paul are the principal part of the Bible that we need to follow. And we're going to we're going to interpret those laws to be completely contrary to any type of Torah.
by the way, uh, that symbol is the menorah, folks. And and there's there's seven um, candlesticks in the menorah, right? This is what was in the temple. This is representative of Yeshua. When he was in the temple looking at a menorah, he said, I am the light of the world, right? So he is referring to himself as the menorah. That is the symbol, not, not the cross. What he's talking about here. And in some um, archaeologists and uh, anthropologists actually suggest that the cross was actually like a tree and and the arms were out like this like a y not not straight out um but more like this where he was hanging on a tree like the word says hanging on a tree cursed is he who hangs on a tree anyway for observant whatsoever the yeshua of the gospel says if i'm going to teach you about me i'm going to take you to the law of moses and show you in the law of moses and the prophets commonly known as it's not, which are the scriptures of God. And that's where you're going to learn about me. So you see the contrast are stark. Even the picture. Luke 24, 44, Yeshua tells you what the gospels are. Do you know in the time of Yeshua, there was no New Testament, right? So it, that can't be considered the gospels, right? And incidentally, technically, it's not the gospel. It's, it's the testimony of those that were with Yeshua and what they saw. And then one who had an encounter with him on the road to Damascus. Yeshua tells you in Luke 24, 44, what the gospel is. Right? The law, the prophets, and the writings all testify unto me. That's the gospel. And that's the uh, scriptures that they were teaching and referring to. And in that time, even in the time of Paul. Sure, even the, the picture in the thumbnail of this uh, video illustrates and demonstrates the stark reality. You have a very Greek Roman looking guy who is the Jesus Christ. And then you have, of course, a depiction of a man uh, praying at the, at the Kotel who is obviously Jewish, right? It's not a small thing is what I'm trying to say. And I don't, I'm not in the habit of, of wanting to confuse people. People say, well, do you believe in Jesus to me? Well, no. Are you a Christian? No, I'm not. To some people, that confuses them. And I appreciate the confusion. I understand it. And I consider it my mission on, on the planet to help teach people, or to help guide them, to help them to learn the difference. And prayerfully, to start walking in the truth. Because there is a gospel of Yeshua and there's a gospel of Jesus. And the two, as I've just illustrated, are not the same. Now, there are plenty of people who love the Messiah, call him Jesus, who follow the gospel. And, you know, Hashem uses that to reach them and to draw them into a deeper truth. And that's perfectly fine. God uses ways that we may may not understand. That doesn't change the reality because as some people would say, well, I mean, you know, but aren't people getting saved by that name? Maybe, maybe not. Yes, they are. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they don't, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the reality of what is the reality, which is that the gospel of Rome is not the same of the go as the gospel that came out of Jerusalem. It's just not. Yeshua says, go to a mikvah. Jesus Christ says, go to a, a, a baptistry. You see what I mean? It goes on and on and on and on. And that's the difference. It's more than just semantics. It's more than just Yeshua is his actual name and it's not Jesus. I'm not the type of person that really gets caught up in that. You're not saying G Yeshua, you know, et cetera. I'm more concerned with what the two names represent. Let me leave you with a final analogy, okay? Suppose you and I allegedly know the same person. Let's just say for the sake of discussion, I call him Avi, and you call this person Frank. Now, you're swearing to me that I'll be frank, the same person. I'm saying, I don't think so. And then 
come to find out, Avi is from, uh, like my friend Avi, he's from Tel Aviv. You say, oh, hey, uh, Frank's from Tel Aviv too. Let's just go on down the line and say, Avi and Frank, they have the same per parents. It's starting to get a little confusing, is it not? He's got the same parents and live in the same city. Perhaps they are, in fact, the same person. But then, as it turns out, the Frank that you know is uh, completely, you know, secular. A wild party kind of person. Uh, just eats whatever they want, goes with whoever they want, does whatever they want, basically just wild and woolly. But the Abi that I know is actually an Orthodox Jew who's very from and a, a very serious person, deeply spiritual, very much a believer in God, very much uh, follows all the, 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 the rules of Kashrut, and has a wife and children and basically lives a quiet life dedicated to the things of God. I'm going to ask you a question. Do we know the same person? Is Avi and Frank the same person? Clearly the answer is no. On a deeper level, but wait, they come from the same city, they have the same parents. So one of us know the real Avi, one of us knows the real person. The question is, which one is the real person? And I think that's a really good question. And the whole point of this, which one is the real person, folks? And, and I told you that in some cases, churches have have created their own version of who Yeshua is, right? And um, this is very dangerous. So it, it's really interesting to me how we have all these different versions of who he is, and some are just so fervent in what they believe about him. But when you compare the two, you're clearly looking at two different people, not the same, the same one. Hold on just a second. I want to get my Bible hub up so we can talk about um, the parable of the ten virgins. Because you're going to see something here. Maybe this has um, never been apparent to you. And, and, and let me just go ahead and pull up the other one so we can see how the Bible interprets itself. Um you know, codes are one thing, but when the Bible interprets it itself, that's another. <clears throat> All right, I think we're ready. Matthew 25, hang in there, folks. So, um, parable of the, of the ten virgins. And an interesting thing about this is five of them are foolish, right? Remember that? Why are they foolish? You're going to see here in just a moment. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps because they had uh, a jug, a vessel. That they could refill their, their lamps because your lamp, you could hold about 24 hours of light. It'll burn for about 24 hours with the full, um, depending on the size. of it. But generally, um, they were made to, to go for about a day, right? So that's all they had. They didn't have any more than that, the, the five foolish ones, right? And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet, meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your, of your oil. For our oil, oil lamps, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves, right? And this is where they're foolish. 
because if they're not going to receive the truth, folks, they'll believe a lie. And what the, the wise virgins did was send them on a wild goose chase, essentially, because they knew very well that you couldn't buy, which is, which, what is, anyway. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went with them to the marriage. They were ready. Why? Because they had oil. And the door was shut. And afterward, also the, the other virgins. So they're just basically showing up late with oil, right? And look what, what happens. They say, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily unto you, I know you not. Okay, so suddenly it goes from whether or not we have oil to, I don't even know who you are. Why is that? Why, why, why is it? What's that? Uh, uh, open up, um, Lord. We got our oil now. Right? Oh, okay, come on in. You got your oil. No, it's, I don't know who you are. Folks, if you're betrothed to someone, wouldn't you know the name of the one you're betrothed to? See the foolishness here, right? Interesting thing about name. Because the, the subject matter of this is the oil. When you look at that in the Hebrew, you see something really interesting. And this is where it's really important to... to um, go study entomology and root words and things like that. So we're basically we have oil, shimen, shin mem noon. But look what happens when we take the noon off it's a name you see the connection between oil and name they didn't have any oil but now they have oil but when they get to the door it's not about oil it's suddenly about a name right i don't know you i don't know your name right and and by the way they use lord lord just like Yeshua says in Matthew 7 when they come to me in the end days and say lord lord we did all these things in what in your name and he says depart from me i don't know who you are it's the same thing it's foolishness there's fools among us running amok casting out demons and prophesying in a name that he doesn't he doesn't acknowledge now let me show you how the bible interprets itself and, and, and it doesn't need the codes to do this in, in this case, but there are codes that confirm what I'm about to show you. Let's go to Song of Solomon, which is a story about what? A bridegroom and bride's oil. Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your loves are better than wine. This is about a bride and a bridegroom. For fragrance your oils are good. Your name is oil poured forth. Oh my gosh. The Bible just told you the secret of the 10 virgins. Your name is oil poured forth. In some translation, it says ointment, but it's the same word, shemin. It means ointment, salve, balm, oil, because the base of each one of those things is, in fact, the oil. <laughs> Your name is oil poured forth. Therefore, the maidens or the virgins love you. The ones that truly love him have his oil. You see why they're foolish now? Because they didn't receive the truth. They received a lie and therefore were found foolish. Folks, the name matters.
And this is why I've been teaching it. And it's the same thing with the Father's name. The Father's name absolutely matters. Incidentally, you can see in John 17 that Yeshua came when he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, I taught them your name. Meaning they didn't know his name up until that point because the rabbis were hiding it from the people. Now it's being revealed. Why? Because in Joel, it says in a day of distress, we will be calling upon his name. Names matter. So I really hope that you, you watch this all the way through because it's just full of important information that you need to get a hold of. And I think it's one of the root problems we have in the church today. I think it's going to, when he said broad is the way and, and narrow, right? Broad is the way to destruction. Narrow is the uh, way to truth. Few who find it. What do we have? Like a billion Christians in the world. How many of you, how many of those are actually saved? Few folks because they believe in lies and deception and traditions of men and they cling to them Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese cling to them and won't let them go and it's not going to save them we got to get back to the truth back to the basics of what the Bible teaches and, and walk away from these denominations that are feeding us with uh, you know a lot of crap. The Bible says that Gentiles will say one day, or the nations will say one day, we inherited lies and falsehoods from our fathers in which there's no profit. I hope you take it to heart. I hope y'all opens his word to you and you see what I'm telling you is the truth. Shalom to you. May y'all bless you. We'll see you in the next video.